Hey gang, it's time for the video where I answer some viewer questions, and I got some good ones, so thank you very much for those. I tried to formulate the answers while I was working on various jobs that came through the shop this week, including this guild with a broken headstock. Okay, got a question about fret sprout, specifically dealing with um, bound fingerboards and how I look after those. Now this is the middle of summer, so it's not the ideal time to address this because all the boards I'm seeing are pretty well humidified. I do, however, have this Gibson. This is a hummingbird that is in the shop. It's relatively new and um, just doing some setup work. The ends of the frets are sharp. Now there's not actually a whole lot of sprout in this case, but I do have to go back and dress them. Um, what happens is when a fingerboard starts to lose humidity and shrink in this direction, the frets, being metal, don't, and they'll start to protrude out past the edge of the fingerboard, and it feels like a whole series of little razor blades on your hand as you run up and down. So um, that's annoying and makes playing less fun. So we have to deal with that. Um, this can also happen on a new guitar where the fingerboard has been glued onto the neck using a water-based adhesive, like either hide glue, tight bond, other yellow woodworking glue that has a lot of water in it and the fingerboard will suck that up and if all of the fret work and dressing has been done while the, the board is swollen like that over time it's going to shrink back and, and basically become sort of the equilibrium is re-established usually the first winter um, for a guitar will see the frets start to protrude a bit and oftentimes you'll need to go back and, and redress those on an older guitar with some play wear, where the lacquer has been removed along the edges of the fingerboard, it's usual just to grab a file and work sort of longitudinally parallel to the edge of the, the board and bring those in line. Um, however, for a new guitar, you're going to remove a lot of the lacquer there and it just looks bad. So the way to do it is to get a piece of painter's tape and put it along the edge of the fretboard um, right up to the edge and get a small file. This one happens to be designed specifically for addressing fret ends, but I like it because it's narrow. And the tape is, is basically a depth stop. You know, you feel where you're going to be working and then it's hard to do this and show you at the same time. Work very, very carefully. It helps to use magnification so you can see what you're doing. Just on that edge. Where this is more difficult is in refretting, where you've got a board that had previously been played a lot, and um, so the edge of the, the board is a radius, is really soft. Uh, sometimes the fret will stick out quite a ways. You have to fill it with glue or something. But you, know, you basically work it down like that until it's flush and even. That At that point, you'll also have made sharp corners on it again, so you're going to have to go back and dress those off. With a file like this, it's got safe edges. There's one flat edge, and this one happens to be rounded. Take the flat edge that goes on the board up against the corner of the fret. A couple of strokes, just to knock off the corner. And then the rounded side, this motion, um, it's three motions in one, actually. You're pushing forward, you're rocking the file towards the fret, and you're also describing an arc with it. So you're going like this, all at the same time. And that's going to soften that corner and make it a bit of a radius. Do both edges. And again, it helps if you have magnification. Doesn't take long, just a few passes, and that's much, much better. Now, at that point, you can take some tape and tape off around it and get yourself some, um, some sandpaper, some 600, 1200 grit paper, and I use micro mesh, and buff it up so it's nice and shiny. And that's how I deal with fret ends. Question, what's the best way to find guitars for a beginner to practice luthery? It's probably going to be like a local um, marketplace style website. Up here it's Kijiji, formerly Craigslist, something like that. Or you could go to say a pawnbroker or an old school mom and pop style music store, someplace that isn't a multinational corporation. Just go in there, tell them what you're interested in doing and see, I mean I bet you they'll be pretty interested. Maybe they have something in the back that's too gnarly to sell, they'll give you a really good deal on. Take that home, do a setup on it, make it play as good as it possibly can in the condition you found it, and then analyze what's wrong and how it could be improved. Then you can do things like maybe replace the nut, make a new nut, see if it's better or you know, as good as the nut that was previously on it. If not, then you do it again. You can take the bridge off and re-glue that. Do a fret dress. 
Um, you can drill out the, the end block for an inexpensive um, pickup like a soundboard transducer. And then, you know, break the headstock and re-glue that. So just sort of build up to it. Um, you don't need a whole lot of guitars, just, you know, maybe one import dreadnought that you can break a bunch of times and then repair. And then maybe you want to get a, an inexpensive Strat style guitar, learn something about electronics. And after you've got, you know, some, got a few jobs under your belt like that, you can start asking friends and family if they've got anything they're, they'd be willing to let you work on. So, you know, it's all about experience and sort of being self-critical when it comes to your work. I'll tell you how I got started. I took the very first guitar that I built by myself, for myself, into the local music store because I needed some strings for it. And the proprietor saw it and said, hey, wow, that's pretty amazing. You know, I just bought this skid full of really inexpensive Korean guitars, learner instruments, and all of the bridges are coming off them. You take them out of the case and they're all lifting. Do you think you can help me out with that? And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So he started feeding me these guitars. I think I did about 17 of them in the, in the space of two months where I would pull the bridge off, clean it up and re-glue it. So I got really good at that, at that particular job. And it just sort of snowballed from there, you know. It's accumulating experience. Okay, a couple of you wanted book suggestions for building guitars or fixing them. And I'll preface this by saying that right now, via the internet, YouTube in particular, uh, you have more information at your fingertips than in every single book that's ever been written on the subject. So you are going to add that to any book that you read because um, these are mostly, at this point, kind of out of date. Um, but that being said, uh, in terms of steel string guitars and classical guitars, probably the best, most comprehensive book ever written is uh, Bill Compiano and Jonathan Adelson's Guitar Making, Tradition and Technology. You can build a guitar from this, no problem. Um, I also like Jonathan Kincaid's Build Your Own Acoustic Guitar is, is excellent, and of course Robert Benedetto's Making an Arch Top Guitar. Those three books you could build a really competent, well-playing guitar. The uh, thing you have to look out for is the earlier books. Now, you know, when I started 20 years ago, there were a handful, there's maybe three or four books that were decent. 30 years ago, there were like two, and they were abysmal. Um, Irving Sloan, who wrote a number of books on classical guitar construction, guitar repair, and a steel string guitar, these sold a lot in the 80s, 70s, and 80s. Um, He's very inspirational. He's an interesting writer. You can't build a guitar from these books. I don't know if anyone ever successfully did because there is stuff that is absolutely necessary to the building process, which is left out of all of them. Um, setup, particularly, and certain geometry that's necessary to make your acoustic guitar work, never addressed in these. But read them. If you like reading and you can get a copy, read it because it's interesting. The guitar repair manual this will give you a snapshot of what was going on in Martin in the late 60s in their repair department, but again, in terms of actual hands-on guitar repair, you'd never do it from this book. Um, there were a lot of interesting classical guitar books that were written sort of in the seven, maybe 80s, 90s. A lot of them from Britain for some reason. I guess those guys could get publishing deals more readily than the Americans. Uh, the English books are all... they're okay. They're hand-tool intensive. They fetishize hand tools to a certain extent, and they're all a little bit idiosyncratic. Like the methods involved, all of them have a wacky idea or two that I've never seen any serious classical guitar builder incorporate into their building method. Um, so the British ones, I mean, you know, interesting read, of course. Uh, I really like Jose Oribe's. I mean, again, he doesn't teach you how to do it, but it's just, it'll make you want to be a guitar maker. The Fine Guitar by Jose Oribe. Uh, Bogdanovich's Classical Guitar Making, that seems like a pretty good resource. I've never actually used all of his methods. I think you could build a, a, a well-playing guitar, classical guitar, from this book. Things get a little bit more tricky when you talk about repair work. Um, there just isn't. In the 80s, Don Teeter was putting out some books, acoustic guitar, which are, eh, they're okay. And then everyone starts off with Dan Erlewine, Guitar Player Repair Guide, good place to start. It'll teach you about setups. It'll get you introduced to a number of concepts. 
Um, the annoying thing is that every six or so paragraphs will go along with a phrase that says, you know, if this intimidates you, take your guitar to a qualified repair person. So it wasn't really designed or marketed towards someone who wanted to learn beyond the basics. It was, it was mostly newspaper column stuff or um, his magazine column that they just adapted for this. So it's, it's a good place to start. I'm not knocking it. I actually liked it. There's good ideas in there. But actual comprehensive repair guide for guitar repair? No, doesn't exist. Um, this is stuff that's passed on from one person to another. You know, at this point, YouTube is your best resource. For electric guitar, eh, again, same thing. I've never really found one that that shows you how to do it profitably and economically. The one I like best is Melvin Hiscock, who is also another English builder. This was an older book that has been, you know, republished a number of times. You can build some decent electric guitars. He talks about angles, talks about some electronics, and the layout is okay. So it jumps back and forth, but I think that's a good place to start. Anyway, like I said, um, just get some books, read them, you know, see if your library has some. Um, to be honest, if you can get your hands on the um, American Luthery, the Big Red Book uh, from the Guild of American Luthiers, they have a whole series of them. I think they're probably up to seven volumes now. These are reprints. You'll learn a lot more from this than you will in any of the, the uh, sort of textbook manuals. Big Red Book's the way to go. Finally, one of you says you really like my speaking voice, my rich, mellifluous tones, and you wish you could hear me sing some Stan Rogers tunes like Northwest Passage. And that tickles me because Stan is actually my homeboy. Stan grew up here in Hamilton and Binbrook and Dundas, about three or four miles away. And um, I've actually sung Stan Rogers tunes in public on a number of occasions. I've done Barrett's Privateers and Northwest Passage and Mary Ellen Carter. Probably can't sing that on this channel because uh, it would get flagged and the way the algorithm works is you wouldn't be able to see this video. This old Gibson ES125, one of the original Cluson tuner shafts is bent so I took off the button there you can see and I'm just giving it a little bit of persuasion in the vise you can see that my vice jaws are, they're wood, but they're lined with leather, and that's kind of important when you're doing this work. And I'm just going to oil those with a little three-in-one oil. I've had like the same bottle for about 15 years. It never seems to go down, but it doesn't take very much. And you see I'm using a whip tip to get just a drop of oil in each of those uh, gears. Don't need much. So we'll get the bridge in the right location, do a little bit of setup, and send you on your way. Thanks for joining me this week. I'll see you again soon.